If you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 20. And we're going to read a story in the Old Testament that the Lord laid on my heart this week. And I want you to let it speak to you. Look in 1 Kings chapter 20. It starts bad, but it ends good. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together. Thirty-two kings were with him with horses and chariots. He went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it when he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad. I want to mention that he was named after his father. His father's name was Hadad, and it means the king of whirlwinds. His father was such a brutal man, and now the son, which notice the terminology of the words it talks about, I'm going to make you like dust. That's He's saying, I am the reincarnation of my father, and I'm coming to destroy like a whirlwind. Verse 3, listen to the enemy. Your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and children are mine. The king of Israel answered and said, O my Lord, O king, just as you say. No resistance. No opposition. You want my family. You want my marriage. You want my business, you want my finances, just as you say, and all that I have is yours. Verse 5, then the messenger came back because the devil never stops. Once you let him in, he takes more and he takes more. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He never stops. If you let him in, he keeps taking. If you don't learn how to resist the enemy, he will never flee. He'll keep coming. And the messenger came back and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, saying, I Indeed, I have sent you, saying, You shall deliver me your silver, your gold, your wives, and your children. But I send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they will search your house. They're coming in your house, and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, anything that brings you pleasure, anything that brings you joy, Anything that makes you just be glad to be alive or it means something that's really precious to you and pleasant when you think about it, I'm taking it. I'm taking it. Whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they will put it in their hands and take it. So the king of Israel called the elders of the land. He said, notice please how these men seek trouble. They've sent me and sent for my wives and children, silver and gold, and I did not deny him. And the elders and all the people said to him, it's bad when the people have to tell the leader how to lead. Do not listen or consent. Therefore he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, tell my lord the king all that you sent your servant. I was willing to do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and he came back. And that's when he says in verse 10, I'll make you like, I'll come like a whirlwind, like there won't nothing be left but dust. Verse 11, finally, the narrative change. The, the narrative changes. So the king of Israel, after saying, yes, 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 you can have it, you can have it. Tell him, let not the one who puts his armor on boast like he who takes it off. Verse 13, suddenly a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel. and God said, I'll deliver the enemy into your hand. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about this story because I believe it's a powerful lesson. You hear a lot in the media today about controlling the narrative. You hear it in politics. You hear it in sports. You hear it in, even in, in, in controversies and crisis. Whoever controls the narrative controls the outcome. That's the thought. That's what people believe. If you keep saying it, doesn't matter what the truth is. Just control the narrative and you will control the outcome. And in this story, it's like... Ben-Hadad, this evil Syrian king and his army, links up with 32 other kings. 
because he had tried to conquer Israel before. You read it again and again and yet again, it says, and yet again, they came against Israel and he couldn't defeat them. But this time was different because he hired 32 different nations, their kings and their armies against one group of farmers, the Israelites. And it was because Ben-Hadad knew the power of their God. And there's that moment when the elders spoke to Ahab with such authority that they said, don't consent. What do you mean? You, you, he, he sent, he kept taking and you haven't stood up. And there comes that moment when the whole narrative of the story changes because if you change the narrative, you change the outcome. So many of us just sit back and let the enemy attack and we think well, we are helpless and that's just how it goes and we don't have any say so. But I've come today to preach about when victory begins to discover that it has a voice. Don't let the enemy do all the trash talking. Don't let the enemy do all the threats and the fear mongering among your life. Don't let the world and other people's opinion even control the narrative of your life. You have to get to that moment, and I love it because there came that moment when something snapped in him. Something said, I have surrendered and gave up all that I'm going to give up. I'm taking Everything you've got, Ben Hadad said, and he said, I was, when I started this conversation, okay. And some of you have your back against the wall. The enemy is coming right now like a flood, like a whirlwind, and he's promising to reduce you down to ashes and nothing but dust. And I love the power of an anointed service. Because you're watching me on television and the enemy said, I want your gold and your silver and your business is under attack. And, he, and he's coming, he said, I want your children and your children are under attack. And your marriage is, I want your wife, I want your husband. It's all hitting on every front. And then he's going through saying, I'm going to take the pleasure and the joy out of life. I'm going to make you so miserable, so maimed that you can't even enjoy. You don't have peace. I want you sucking your teeth. I want you negative. I want you walking around just hating life and bitter and angry and mad and upset. Everything pleasant, I'm coming after it. And that might be how you walked in here, but you came to the wrong service and you're watching the wrong program because the prophet showed up with a word from the Lord in the text that I read. And that word is still alive in this year, in this day, in this hour, and in our lives and our families. Even a rabbit, when it gets away from a, from a predator, you know, they do something. Look this up. Don't do it while I'm preaching. But, but look this up. When they have a victory in their life and they escape, They'll get somewhere and just jump up in the air and kick one leg out. It's called a binky. They do the binky. I mean, a little rabbit can get away from a fox and say, the devil thought he had me, but he, he didn't have me. And, and, and he'll jump up and kick. And some of you, God's given you a job, given you a house, blessed you coming in, blessed you going out, and you're still too sophisticated to give God a shout. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. I don't care what you are. You ought to give him a praise if it's been good. Even nature says the victor ought to make some noise. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians. Everybody say, victory has a voice. Look how big this voice, and look how big this is. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, this incorruptible shall put on incorruption. This mortal has put on immortality. 
Then shall it be brought to pass the saying, death. Notice the wording. It's, how do you swallow unless you got a mouth? Death is swallowed up in victory. Victory's got a mouth that can, if he can, if Jesus could give voice, he's saying, if, I don't care what you're facing. If I can conquer death, I can conquer anything. And I have swallowed up death in victory. Whatever, whenever your team is winning, you're supposed to be the loudest team. Talk victory. Walk into the battle with the word of God. Even Jesus, when he comes back after the rapture takes place, the nation of Israel will be surrounded. And the Bible said all nations will turn against Israel. And folks, we're seeing it right before our eyes. They're still fighting that ben Hadad spirit. That's all that is. How can you like this story and not love those people? But the Bible says, it's one of the prophecies, that every nation in the world will turn their back on Israel. And in that moment, God, Jesus Christ, will get on a white horse and ride down into the valley of Megiddo where the armies look like they're going to win. And he will open his mouth. And just when it looks like all the armies are going to destroy Israel, your Bible said a sword will come out of his mouth and consume the Antichrist and consume the false prophet and consume the beast. Oh, hallelujah. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And I want to say, if you've lost someone that you love, why don't you make your narrative instead of oh, it's so sad and the pleasure's gone and there's no joy left? Why don't you change the narrative and give victory a voice and say, death, you have been swallowed up in victory because of Jesus. There's an empty tomb and there is eternal life. I pray today that there would be a holy losing it. That people like Ahab, but there's that train fighter and then there's those people that just lose it in the moment. And something just takes over. And I tell you, part of the battle that we're in is when you decide to give victory a voice in the situation. All things. So what, what, how do I give it a voice? Walk out of here, number one, saying he's with me. Jesus is with me. He never will leave me. There's nothing that can ever make him leave me. He is with me. I'm going to be all right. I'm not promising you that everything's going to change. I'm promising you that whatever pack of lines you have lined in, you have to go into, whatever fiery furnace you have to walk through, you're going to find Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll dry your tears. I'll Weeping will endure for the night. I'm going to bring joy in the morning. The sun's going to shine. Number one. Number two, my Bible said you should walk out, change the narrative by saying this. All things. Well, since I got a stage, all things work together for the good. You don't believe that. Not just the good things. Not just the pleasant things. Not just the successful things, but all things work together. Oh man, I can walk in confidence. I can say, well, I don't understand this. I don't understand. 
how eggs and flour and salt and sugar over here are going to make me a good cupcake. I don't get it. Well, the reason that it's not good is it's not all together yet. All you're tasting is the salty part. All you're tasting is the baking soda. All you're tasting is the flour. But when he puts it all together, actually, I don't talk about my wins. I talk about how I was so low that I didn't know how I was going to make it. Now I can praise him. It makes me love him more. Not just the wins, thank God for it, but it's the struggles. It all works together for the good. So change the narrative. Quit talking. Defeat and disaster and depression and hopelessness. Death has been swallowed up in victory. What can the enemy do to you but give you a shortcut to heaven? I want you to stand to your feet at every campus. No one moving, please. Pastor, I need this. I need exactly what you're preaching. I'm so negative. I'm so, I'm so eat up with the circumstances. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have victory's voice in my life. If that's you, I want you to come as families. I want you to come as couples. I want you to come and I want you to stand down here and we're going to declare and we're going to pray over you today. And I want you to come now. I mean, let's go. Let's do this. I don't like to just preach and end it. I don't want this to stop. I want, I want an adjustment in the spirit. All things are working together. Say that. All things. He's working all things for my good. Beautiful. Come on. Come on. Get in as close as you can get. Get in as close as you can get. At every campus, the pastors are coming. But they're going to start singing this song, and I felt like it's the right song because it's just declaring it. Can we take a few moments, and if you need to slip out, you can slip out when we begin to pray here and thank you for being with us. But we're going to linger just a minute and we're going to worship the Lord. So lift your hands up right now and just declare there's going to be a victory because of Jesus. Because of the cross. Because of the blood. Because of the blood that is shed. in this room and you said, God doesn't care about me. I don't matter. I don't matter to my family. I don't matter to anybody. The Lord just told me to tell you. Tell them they matter. Pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, wash me. Cleanse me. I receive by faith in my heart and the confession of my mouth, I receive victory because victory is mine through Jesus Christ. That means from this day forward, wherever I go, Jesus goes. That means from this day forward and even before this day, he works all things together for the good because I'm called and I matter.
give God all the praise. Give him all the praise. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. Praise God. If you gave your heart to the Lord, if you need prayer, if this spoke to you today, we would love to hear from you. Go online or use the number on screen and get in touch with us and tell us what God has done for you. Before I go, I want to take a moment to thank every single one of you who support this ministry because you have given us the resources we needed to stand in unwavering support for the nation of Israel during this time of war. On October the 7th, the peaceful villages of Eshkel faced an unthinkable, a merciless invasion by Hamas terrorist soldiers. The aftermath left a community shattered, especially its vulnerable members, the children, the elderly, some even Holocaust survivors, the pregnant mothers, and the wounded, marred men and women. This is the same region that for the last five years we have been building life-giving projects such as a fire station, fortified kingdom play school, fortified bomb shelters that saved many, many lives during the attack on October the 7th. And we give God the glory for that. And so we ask our friends and the people that we partnered with on so many buildings and so many works that we've worked with there, what do you need during this time of war? And they were instantly very clear in their request. They said, what we need is we need the Eshkol Resilience Center. This building will serve as a beacon of hope. It will be a place where shattered lives will be mended and broken hearts will find peace. It will provide treatment for PTSD. That is almost every child, every human being that was there. They need some help mentally and they are shaken. They are wounded in their souls and in their spirits because they watched their own loved ones slaughtered and killed. There's no family there that was not personally affected in massive, massive ways. These horrifying attacks that happened on October the 7th, and we must never forget, we must never stop standing with Israel. And even though the news has moved on for the most part, we continue to pray and give support in every way we can, even during the ongoing war. Because we need to stand with Israel. God said, I'll bless those that bless Israel. And I'm asking you today to help us. We've made a million dollar new commitment to build the Eshkol Resilience Center. Will you consider giving a special gift to help us today. Pray about it. That's all I want you to do. I'm not going to tell you what to give. You ask God what He wants you to give. Thank you, and please continue to pray for Israel. I'm standing here in the Zach's house, the Zach family house in Kibbutz Kisufim, the first community that we introduce you to. On October 7, this entire family perished. When we walked after the atrocities of October 7 into this house, we saw the father lying here behind me on the floor with a knife in his hand, and in the shelter behind me, the mother in bed, hugging her son, both dead and both burned alive. But just like this instinct of a family, to protect each other, to save each other. This is what we feel with you, Pastor Jensen Franklin, and your entire congregation. It was an instinct, a family instinct, to come and stand with us and to remind us that we are not alone. You are responding immediately because you know us. You know us already for many years before, and you committed to build a resilience center that will give us therapy for our communities to heal together. In these atrocities of October 7, we know that we will rebuild again. It will be painful and hard, but we know that with you, we can make it happen, step by step, together as a family.
I am a teacher and an educator at Nofe Habasho, which is a council's regional high school. We woke up when we heard a lot of explosions. We entered the safe room. I am going out to see what's happening. I got a voice message around 8.30 and that's it. I didn't see him after that. Around 11 a.m., I think two men walked into the safe room wearing uniforms and armed. They took me out of the house and brought me to a car near the dining room. And from there, we drove into the Gaza Strip to Khan Yunis. Yes, we heard the bombings and the IDF. I was always in the approach of there was a boom. I'm alive, so everything is fine. It's not that it wasn't scary. There were moments, it was very scary. And the thing I was most afraid of was that some missile would hit the house and they would die. And I would stay alone, because what will an Israeli woman do alone in Khan Yunis? The thing that bothered me the most all the time is what happened to my family. When I left, I knew the boys were alive. About Raviv, I knew nothing. And the worry about them and the fear of what happened to them terrified me. It was really, really hard for me that they don't know that I'm alive and that I'm okay. This program has been sponsored in part by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.